let's play that. So, what we're talking about is um, a few things to do with, um, we could frame it as film technique, but we could also think of it as the graphic language that you guys should be employing, and some of them are technical means, and some of them are aesthetic means, with creating a title sequence. Um, this also relates to the five C's. Yeah, it's on my bread. Do you have my bit of paper? Yeah, right, yeah. Oh, sorry. The screen's not see-through. So I'll be relating camera angles, continuity, cutting, close-ups, and composition in what we're seeing. All film is edited. All narrative sequence is edited. And if it isn't edited, and we have um, the example of the film Russian Art, which is one great big three-hour shot, it is exquisitely planned and practiced. So therefore the editing happens before the camera starts shooting. The process of joining shot A to shot B. So what we've just seen with those two student examples is it isn't one long continuous tape. There are jumps from one shot to the next. There are four types of um, transition and that's what we mean getting from shot A to shot B. It's the, bit in between. Um, <clears throat> there's the fade in, and this happens um, from black. There's the fade out toward black. There is um, a whole range of dissolves, but they're just commonly known as a dissolve. Um, there is the white, and then of course there is the cut itself, and we jump from one thing to another. And they all relate to different aspects of time. Generally, the longer the transition, the greater amount of time that takes place. Or, if it's fading to black, it's almost as if this part of the story has ended. So looking here, we can see a fade to black. It's that straightforward. Very easy to achieve in After Effects. The reverse is fading into black. So this could be the next day, or another planet, or a different person's take on the same thing. So even with what you're doing with the title sequence, it does not necessarily mean that it is a whole sequence of graphic material. There could be fades in and out of black. So if we consider the film The Fly, and what we saw this morning with the buzzing and the kind of electronic sounds, it could, you could hint at the whole structure of the film with key images that you have generated. The dissolve is when it just melts from one shot to the other. If you've ever seen the original Star Wars films, you'll see that George Lucas goes transition crazy. He uses every one that's possible and it makes a bit of a mockery of the film. But it is essentially a cowboy film in outer space. Question? What's that? Is this yes, yes, yes it is on the internet. But this will be on the internet. This. So the wipe shot, you have something that looks like one picture is being pushed out of the screen towards another picture. And this can be used rather sophisticatedly in that if the shot follows a person walking, so it looks like they're carrying the film with them. Um, wipe shots, they're also known as blinds, or um, there's all sorts of radial wipes. But these days you don't see them a lot. Um, these were more often used when filmmaking itself wasn't as technically sophisticated. So as we have the um, heavy reliance upon CG these days, we don't see this type of thing happening. It's just a series of cuts. However, with some of the movies that could be historical, yes. and they are riddled with cliché, and some of the more heaviest shots. Back to Star Wars. Yeah. Might actually improve. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. If, well, if you think, what, what's the that? Nation, what's that cowboy one? The, um, the tie. No, the other cowboy one. Oh, the, black yeah, the black tiger. So that's 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 quite camp 
in its own way. So it could use these um, very, very well. So the cut, shot B, snaps to shot A. Simple as that. Um, we see that in films like, um, what's the Tarantino film we pulled? Pulp Fiction. And in the opening scene when there is the couple discussing how much they love each other before they rob the place. And the point of view snaps between one person talking and the other person talking. You always see the other person over the shoulder. So editing works, these shot-to-shot -shot relations works in, hand, in tandem with the way that a shot is composed. And after the break, we'll look at um, that opening scene from um, Pulp Fiction. So transitions, the viewer perceives a shot as an uninterrupted segment of screen, time, space, or graphic configurations. Fades, dissolves, and wipes are perceived as gradually interrupting one shot and replacing it with another. A change in time, in other words. Cuts are perceived as instantaneous changes from one shot to the next. It's a change in space. And we're going to see an example um, which just looks like normal shot-to-shot -shot filmmaking, but there'll be an exclamation, an exclamation which um, may widen your view on its potential. An example, shots can be thought of as how a scene is framed and recorded via the camera, real or virtual. The way the shot is framed is part of a thing called, we, um, called the mise-en-scene process. And what the mise-en-scene is, it relates directly to this last thing here, composition. When filmmakers practice their craft, everything that's in the shot is exactly how it should be. Everything is designed. Nothing is just sloppily thrown in there. Even um, there's a new version of the film, Evil Dead, coming out which was made in New Zealand and people I have worked for did the art department and there was someone whose job was just to dab dust on certain parts and to put trails, entrails and guts in certain places and the director would be looking there saying no I want more blood over here, I want more blood over there because the camera is going to pull to that place. In constructing a moving image sequence or a motion graphic sequence Nothing is just thrown there. It's all there for a purpose. So it is the opposite of what happened with the text and image exercise last week. And sometimes the text was just kind of placed there and there was no consideration. So here's an example of mise-en-scene. Have you ever watched kids in Okay, that's enough of that. So everything in that is composed. Nothing's thrown in, 
for the argument, oh, I thought it looked cool. Everything is considered. Yeah, this is student work. Um, editing. So we're looking here at the top at camera angles. Camera angles describe not only the relationship of the person to the screen, but our relationship to that person. So we have here a bunch of shorthand um, phrases from XLS, extra long shot, to long shot, to medium long shot, to medium shot, to medium close up, close up, um, bracketed close up, and extreme close up. So through these different framings, we have different relationships to this character. Either he is part of the world, or we are part of his psychology. So from the very first shot to the very, very end shot, if we're just focusing on a person's eyes and mouth, we're looking at their emotional space. If the way in the distance, we're seeing the world they occupy. If it's a medium close-up, we're understanding part of their body language. So the way a person carries themselves, it's that whole body language thing that we hear about at high school. The bracketed close-up, it could be more action generated, so it's to do with eating or laughing or shouting. Whereas here, I haven't got a pointer, um, we're looking instead from the BCU to the XCU, so instead of action to actually internal spaces. With the camera angle, again, we see back here that the camera is just very straight on. It's a very orthographic view. It's almost like a technical drawing. With the camera angles, again, we start to position ourselves in terms of our relationship to this character. So if we think about the low shot that's at the top left-hand um, side, they're bearing over us. They become more menacing. If they're at eye level, there is a certain amount of equalness happening. They are at the same power of existence as we are. But with the high shot, they occupy a space of being inferior or subordinate to us. They are more the case of the naughty child. And we can see that between those two extremes. The low shot, the character looks like a bully. Whereas with the high shot, as I've just said, the character looks like a naughty kid. With the worm's eye view, it looks like they are gods, or giants, or we're an ant, or as the phrase says, we are a worm. We could be something on the ground. We may no longer be as a human, as the viewer. And that's the thing to always consider now when you watch a film, is when you're watching it, don't just let it soak into you. Look back at it. When the camera shoots something, Consider, who am I in this shot? Am I the character? Am I an observer? Am I part of the environment? With the canted view, we see that, um, if, you've, if you've ever seen the original TV series of Batman, it has um, these kind of weird, crazy angles. And we see it happen in some of Tarantino's films. And we see it happen in the Matrix series of films. And it takes on either a kind of camp Austin Powers point of view, or it's referencing something to the 60s, or it has a, or it has a relationship to the graphic novel and the comic book, or something that's happening inside the actual narrative sequence itself. Maybe that character's just taken drugs or has been drinking, or something weird is going on. So if we had um, strange synth synthesizer music going on, it adds to what's going on here. If we had some classical music, it wouldn't really make much sense. And then the bird's eye view, 
We're no longer a human. We're this thing that's flying over a landscape. We're taking the view of maybe um, a bird or an aircraft, or we're seeing part of a whole landscape and we're just picking out this one thing. Go on. These are the, the signs and symbols of cinematography. You need to be looking for these things in your movie, okay? Because they are significant decisions by the director. It's incredibly expensive to get a bird's eye shot. So if the director's using a bird's eye shot, they're using it for a very specific reason. And I can think in a number of movies where bird's eye shots, of real movies where bird's eye shots are used. Um, when you've got a worm eye view or a low view, the director's also telling you something significant, usually about key characters. Okay? Who is the most important person? So this is visual language, signs and symbols sitting there for you to read. You have to open your eyes and read them. You've got to be aware of the way that shots are being used so that you might pick up on one or two of these and understand your story better and then be able to move your own ideas forward. Okay. Types of shots. Camera and lens movement. So what we've seen here is just the camera being set in a static manner. We also have the camera that can move, and again, After Effects can, when we get our heads around it, provide these um, types of view as well. So a pan is when we're almost rotating around. So you see there's the use of perspective going on there. With the crab left and crab right, the camera's moving parallel to the object. Now, of course, upon the screen we don't see the camera we just see things passing through and the track in and the track out it is different to a focus pull it's actually the camera getting closer and the perspective the um, background element of the character slowly disappearing as the character takes prominence so again in visual language it's about them dominating the scene. It's about a focus shifting towards the thing. So we have here a little model of Dennis the Menace. This also could work with typography or an image. Yes, question? Um, is it grabbing the actual camera or the The camera moves. Okay. Yeah, it's... What's that? Um, semantically, yes. But... Um, um, yeah, I'm not sure I see what you mean, but um, we could discuss this later. <laughs> Someone gets it, that's the main thing. So using, um, you can also use a lens zoom. If you combine a lens, a lens zoom and a focus pull and moving the camera all at the same time, that's how you produce that effect in films where the person is kind of keeping still but the whole background bends and gets deeper and weirder. Um, it usually happens in film when a person is shocked or um, brought to attention or under duress or there is a dilemma and the whole background pulls and shifts. Um, a pedestal up, known as a ped up, is when the camera is actually physically moving up and down. And then the last one is a variation of that where instead of the camera moving, the camera is tilting. So instead of, if it was a human, instead of bending one's knees, you'd be craning your neck. So you see that there is a more of a perspective use there at the bottom than there is in the middle of the shot. The middle shot could be used to describe something 
that is extraordinarily large or gigantic. So again, think of it in terms of type or in terms of image. So, let's see how these shots are used. Um, the birds, Mr. Hitchcock, considering also space, time, graphic relationships, and rhythm relationships. So these are the relationships, once again, between one shot and another. So there'll be camera pose and also um, interplays of light and dark, line and shape, volumes and depths, and movement and stasis, which means keeping still. These are independent of the uh, what well, these are independent of the shots relationship to time and space. So we're looking at it in terms of graphic design business. So in the scene we're going to um, have a look at there is Melanie. She's in yellow and green, but the external space it's in blues, greys, and reds. So if we think about the color circle, there's a certain amount of um, complementary color structure going on and then in the movements Melanie on the inside is going from left to right but on the outside we're going from right to left so there are ways to not make things boring by putting them in um, contradiction with each other editing together any two shots from its interaction this can be through similarity or difference if it is different, then the narrator wants the viewer to realize conflict or di diversity between the two shots to expand upon what is occurring in the commonly experienced narrative. Hopefully the video's there. Here it is. So it's a very shallow shot. Shallow focus. Yellows and greens. It's a very, very deep focus. Blues and reds. Lots of people to suddenly a few people once they stop squabbling. We go from inside to outside. So there's all these balances going on. The people are far, the people are close. There's something going from one way and the people are craning their neck. So there's this whole positioning of the edit which helps tie things together. So we saw that bit where she freezes and she goes to another pose and she freezes and she goes to another pose. Okay, I think this, this clip ends pretty soon. Yeah. So we went from that high establishing shot to her going into a very confined space. Okay, so we had that high establishing shot into the very confined space, so there's contrasts going on. There was comparisons going on with the guy in the car coming straight towards us. So there's these small volumes almost apparently hitting each other. Then it goes from the very neutral colors to the red fire, which is a psychological turn, and then the car misses. And that previous thing with the timing, what Hitchcock is, exper is experimenting with is shortening the actual space that she holds those really hokey looking poses 
So one is um, 18 frames and it goes down to 12 frames and it goes down to 8 frames. And that was a way to ramp up people's tension as if they could feel the thing that was going to happen. Of course, you could see the man with the match and you could see the gas flowing, but that wasn't enough. Hitchcock was trying to twist every dial possible and people knowing what's going to happen. So they're on the inside going, no, no, no. And when it does happen, there is a greater emotional release. Graphic relationships. Editing, to, editing together any two shots works upon similarities, creates a term known as the graphic match. This can be done either by a combination of the following ways. Shape, colour or composition. Now those that have been in the Edward Scissorhands group, you've seen an exact version of that. Now I'll show it to everybody eventually. The first one we have is um, oh, Seven Samurai. I'll come back to that after the break. So here we have two stills, um, rather bad photocopies and my apologies, taken from, does anyone know this film? Aliens, yeah. So it's right at the very, very end and um, all sorts of hell is broken out. Ripley is on the um, little wee lifeboat and she's just closed her hibernation chamber and there is this curve of her face with a penumbra of light behind it and it cross fades into the earth. So there is the similarity of form and light and it lets us know that she is heading home. Of course, those of us that have been unfortunate enough to see Aliens 3 know that it doesn't happen. Another example of a graphic match. Now this is just a piece of photography, but we see on the left, we see the same thing being used. So perspective is being used as a trick to match the shape of what we imagine a skirt to be to fit in this lovely tulip. Going back to film, we have here the sequence, um, the final two shots of the sequence of the film um, Psycho, again by um, Alfred Hitchcock. Um, the man who storyboarded this, um, the, the murder scene is none other than Saul Bass, and it was his storyboard that directed exactly how it was to be shot. What we're talking about in this lecture is ways to draw a storyboard. So it doesn't matter if, you're, if you can only render something out in stick figures to begin with. It is how you position that stick figure in terms of space and angle and tracking. But here we have a really good um, graphic match between the blood starting to um, go down the sink and her eye um, as the life fades out of her. Simple as that, the two circles located centrally in the screen. And here's that um, shot from Edward Scissorhands, in that the woman who thinks herself to be something rather tasty is inadvertently copying this pose of a um, naked mannequin. Not only does she have her sultry come hither look, but we can imagine that she herself not only may think of herself as a bit of a model or a catch, but she's actually mentally placing herself as a naked person in front of um, the camera. At the moment in the camera, we are Edward. We are taking his point of view. And so we should be shuddering as much as the look on his face is in the next shot when he's just kind of all bulgy-eyed. We see also here the other two models. They are both put in rather suggestive poses. So this is also, as well as graphic match, we could think about this in terms of um, composition as well. Uh, especially that, you know, green... It's a complementary colour to red. It really, really stands out. There's this background of green 
but her green and red color combination are the most um, saturated. So the eye is naturally pulled toward um, her as a um, subjective object. I'll just go back. So the next piece is um, a motion graphics piece, a title sequence piece of graphic match. Yes. Yep, you can do that in After Effects as well. Was that the question? Yeah. All right. Yeah, it's known as a color pull. So we've all seen this show, Dexter. No, okay. Um, if you haven't, you can see it on YouTube. Um, it's a story about a man who's a serial killer who wants to kill for the sake of good. Um, and obviously strangulation is a way to get rid of a person. And we see that form of strangul strangulation happening in the um, dental floss and then the same almost graphic, it's almost the same handhold in the... Um, shoelaces. So again, there's an example of a graphic match. And there's another one. The, circ the greater circular form, the inner circular form, the holes, and then the one nice circle of blood. It's just all circles. And we have this great, great contrast of colour. And do they mean to reference Hitchcock here with the shower scene from Psycho of blood running down the drain? I'd say that would be a certain amount of yes to that. Graphic relationships, so background elements, as well as matching mid shot, um, as well as mid shot matching the moving image maker can also call attention to graphic matches at transitional moments. Another graphic match from, uh, from this film, Paris, Texas, Vim Vendors. Uh, in this instance, the shot is mildly discontinuous. There's a slight line cross. He's looking one way, that guy's looking the other. So if you put them face to face, they're not quite eye to eye. But when, he, when we cut from one thing to another, we have the similarity of the mountain. So in terms of building motion graphics, you could have backgrounds that look similar. And we see that within the Pacific um, title sequence, that the foreground changes, but there is this background. It's almost like a motif of the line always traveling through things, and the line taking on different meanings. Graphic relationships in the birds. So here we see um, it's the stillness of Melanie. So we've already seen that shot. We won't go to that against the gasoline rushing. So she is frozen in horror, and then we have the petrol running along the ground. So we have this complete um, um, contra... What's the word? Contra contradiction? Contrast. Thanks. We have this complete contrast of movements taking on. So the graphic relationships they don't need to always be in sympathy with each other. It's really accentuating that one thing on one hand and the direct opposite, because that with tight editing creates something that's really visually um, attention grabbing. Yes, and her mouth's always open. Rhythmic um, relationships between shot A and B, as well as music, and music is the other half of a motion graphics piece. We'll be dealing with that in the second part of the semester. So there is, um, as well as the music, we have the idea of accent and beat and tempo. So if we consider the title sequence to the um, um, intro sequence to, uh, I just said that, to Dexter, we have parts that move really, really slow, 
and we have parts that move really, really quickly. So when he's doing that thing with his hands, that's quite fast because it feels slightly murderous. But then when he's cutting into a piece of fruit and when the coffee's being ground, that moves really slowly. So again, we have this um, different feelings of types of destruction. But not only is there in the speed of the shot, but there is um, the movement, which is what we've been talking about, how the camera moves, the rhythm of the sound, and um, more importantly, storyboard development. And Sue's been saying that to some of you this morning, you know, what parts of the film moves quickly? What parts of the film moves slowly? And how do you um, signify that in your synopsis? And how are you going to relate that in the title sequence as well? Because if it's all going at the same pace, there's nothing dynamic going on. So again, think of how dynamic music can be. The whole idea of the verse, the chorus, some kind of solo, the outro, the bridge. They all have different paces. And the rhythmic relationships between the birds, there is a discernible pattern. Lengthening shots lower the pace. So however, you know, if the shot is really, really long, it feels kind of slow and boring. So the, the dialogue pieces, they're really trying to flesh out and accentuate the idea that these birds are attacking. And that's essentially what some of the conversations are about for a good five or six minutes. These birds attacking. No, there isn't. Yes, there are. What kind of birds are attacking? They're these kinds of birds. Those kinds of birds don't attack. Yes, they do. It happened at the school. Birds attacking. Birds attacking. So they're just reinforcing the point that birds are attacking. But then when it comes to the action, that all happens really, really, really quickly. So there's chop, 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 chop. And the difference between those rhythms, again, adds to that feeling that there is this drawn-out horror that then explodes and becomes unmitigated disaster. Gosh, I put a lot of words in this. In accelerating the pace of a moving image work, it creates a visual sense of compulsion. The viewer's attention is accelerated by the needs of the viewer's means of perception. So if you have lots of cuts, you're making someone's brain work a lot faster. So people have to keep up, and there's a sense of panic. And that's really important to start to think about, because that's what we're talking about next week. So when you're watching your film, what is the director trying to tell you by the way that he's cutting this information together? And how can you pick up on that and play with that cutting in your title sequence? Or elements within it. Because if we think about the title sequence 7, some of the shots are quite long, but the text has its own crazy rhythm to it. So in the normal space of the world, there is this small, frissive, bubbling, ugly thing. Yeah, if you help the world, help how they want to do it. You said something about Santa Cruz. About two girls getting lost in a fog and then flying towards the lights. And that would be fog. Make that wrong fog. You smoke fog. What? So notice how the pace is picking up here. No. Yeah, they're just not even good. And they've all got no sense of smell. Even if I we can understand that even Yeah, it's still goofy, but you can see what he's trying to do, yeah? 
All right. It's it, it goes on. It's exactly the same shot. So there's spatial relationships. Editing allows uh, the viewer to conceive desperate shots as a whole scene. That's recorded in two separate places. It's not recorded all in the same scene. All the indoor stuff is shot in um, California, whereas all the outdoor shot, um, Hitchcock wasn't there, it was all shot in Maine. So the bits when we see them looking out the window and then the gas station, they weren't together. Um, Hitchcock had a fear of outdoor spaces, so he would make as much of his film indoors as possible. And that's where you hear, um, if you've ever heard it in the film world, a thing called second unit. They're the people that do all the outside shots and all the um, blue screen shots and all the action shots, where the main unit does all the actors talking and that malarkey. Give them a break soon? Okay. The most common example is in any news interview where a reporter is cut away to and seen nodding. No news gathering um, outfit can afford two camera operators. You would have seen this in the news. Someone being interviewed and then the reporter goes, and so, blah, 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 blah. They do all that afterwards and it's all put together in the editing room. If you ever see someone doing a live interview and you see them wiping a tear away, that's bullshit. It doesn't happen. Um, the TV show Holmes was quite famous for it. Uh, any series of shots that in the absence of an establishing shot cues the viewer to infer a spatial hole on the basis of seeing only portions of that space. Now, that's a poor way to write it. There's an easier way to think of things. We have two concepts, the room and the window. In the room, we have a finite space. We know everything that's here. So you can compose a shot as a room, or you could compose a shot as a window. So if one of us pulled the blinds open, we would see a bit of a building, a bit of a road, and a couple of trees. But because things are cut off and it seems to be a wider world, we fill the space in for us. So that means that as well as every other graphic consideration, there's also graphic reduction. You don't have to spell out a whole scene by putting everything in it. If we think about the fly again, you could start with a black and white rendition of the telepod and then maybe have two cables that lead off and the camera follows that. And maybe text comes out of the cables, but you can't use that idea anymore. So spatial relationships, and I'll, after this one, we can have a break. So this is not only a space relationship, but there's another relationship going on as well. Hopefully this is loud enough.
Okay. <clears throat> oh, no, it's still going. All right, I'll stop it there. Can I go back? No, no. So, what were we looking at? What's that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what we were looking at is two films. The shot of the angry guy and the shot of the, um, of the smart-ass standing up man with the dog. There's 40 years difference between those two films. But because of the way that they've been edited together and there's a little bit of cutting out of backgrounds, we conceive it to be a whole. And that's the beauty of cutting. Let's just have another look. 1940-1980. We don't actually see them both face to face in the same shot. Yet because they are joined together with simple cuts, we're actually conditioned to see it as a whole. That's a very cool trick. That is a film called Dead Men Don't Wear Plaid. And the whole film is like that. There is um, over a dozen black and white film noir films that are sampled from. And Dean Martin? No. Steve, Steve Martin, Dean's brother. Steve Martin plays this actor on top of all these other films and it's quite an amazing trick that they pull and it's actually a funny film. But anyway, what was that? Oh, was it? Oh, I must be mean. Okay, we'll pause there. Temporal relationships between shots A and B. Back to the serious stuff. So, um, films we normally accept are told in a one, two, three, four um, means of story development. Um, beginning, middle, um, a bit towards the end, the end. But um, innovative storytelling, um, innovative motion graphics, um, experimental um, narrative practices, but they don't always um, follow that structure. Do I have something after this? Okay. Um, and two films that um, you may know of, especially the first one. Who's seen the film Memento? Yeah. It's told backwards forwards, isn't it? It's everything's in nine minute chunks and that gets told forward but then it goes backwards one more and then backwards one more. So we get to the very, very beginning of the film at the end. And the very beginning of the film, at the very end of the film is at the beginning, of course. So uh, this, that one is Slaughterhouse-Five. Um, this isn't a montage, which I'll get to the definition of that right at the very end, but this is the way, this film from 1972, this is the way that the film worked. And it's um, by a man called um, Kurt Vonnegut, and he writes the book, um, and then he gets all the chapters and mixes them up and then publishes the book. Because it's a story about a man who has troubles with time and space. Where's the sound? No, the sound's up full. So we're going, we're going, we went from the Second World War to him as an older man who's now being approached by a UFO. Here comes the UFO, and then suddenly he's a boy in the shower. And it's this very fractured way to tell a story in that if you walk in on it you just get horribly confused it's telling a story from the center outwards and only once when you get to the very end you start to tie the pieces together because one of the problems with um, the average Joe on the street cinema is that it's just a and then and then and then and then process it's something known as a linear dialogue the story's just told forwards. It's something that a six-year-old could record, could recall back. But things like this are more experiential and weird 
and it takes more brain power and therefore more attention. Of course, you have the risk of losing half the audience. Good, it ended right there. End of spiel. So here is Memento, where um, you'll be able to tell as this progresses that the Polaroid in the shot here is working in reverse. So this is all a very, very clever, you know, they shot it forwards and then the editor spooled it back. So when the viewer's seeing it, it's actually playing backwards. And that happens a lot with film. If you see, ever see a stunt of someone being stabbed with a knife, that's normally a thing called a reverse shot, where it's very, very easy. I need a stabby thing. I'll just use this soap. Where they start like this, and the director calls action, and you pull it back really violently, because when that's reversed, it really looks like the knife, the DVD knife, is sticking into the throat. Okay, here, we can see. The shot's being reversed, and as an introduction, it really says a lot about the film. We're seeing forwards, backwards, or we're seeing backwards, forwards. Maybe we're seeing backwards, forwards. And then we have this, oh, you know, people suddenly, oh, the film's going backwards now. And then we have this happen. If you haven't seen this film, it is available at the library. Is this one where he writes yes, yes, he's the man with the memory problem, so there's a lot of tattooing going on. And that's where it ends. Temporal relationships, so that's things being out of phase or out of sequence or being accentuated the wrong sort of way. Um, editing allows us to alter the natural duration of story events. And that's obvious, isn't it? Because a 90-minute film usually doesn't cover 90 minutes of reality. Who saw the film Django? Yeah, a lot of you. So we don't see the shots of them travelling in a carriage or a horse to get to the next town. They ride out of the shot, then they ride back into the shot and there's another place. And we naturally accept that. There is a visual language component to that. A thing normally has to leave the screen. Or at the very beginning, as I was showing you, dip into black. So they may be clippy-clopping along, the camera's tracking them through the um, landscape, and it fades to black, and it goes silent, and then it opens up with them riding now through a city. And we accept that time and space has changed. So, in the birds we see Melanie turning away many times, in the shots like this it takes normal time, but those little bits have been cut out. So, you can cut out big amounts or small amounts, it doesn't really matter, it's still called a temporary ellipsis. You see it with people leaving, walk, taking the first step on a staircase, and then it cuts to the last step in a staircase, and we naturally fill those details in. And that's a thing called a guest out law, and we'll be covering that next week, the way that the mind has this ability to recognize patterns and to fill in details. It's a very important thing in our craft. Um, temporal ellipsis can also, um, as you can see here, what I've just been talking about, using the white dissolve and fade transitions, or by the screen exit technique, or by means of a cutaway. So a cutaway would be that you would have um, one scene and then it would cut to a car speeding, and then it would cut back to the same scene, but things have slightly changed. So while the people are in the house trying to pack up the jewels and the things they've stolen, the police are careening on their way. So you can use a shot of another thing to talk about time moving on with the seconds, minutes, or hours. Now if you get a whole bunch of those different views, whether they just be matter of seconds or camera movements being moved or um, minutes or hours if you put a whole bunch of them together it's called a thing called a montage now um, those of you that have seen the South Park film I believe there's a little wee tune about everybody getting a montage but it's basically any scene in a film where they're getting a whole bunch of 
scenes, putting them together to explain a greater amount of time. So who's seen the film Revenge of the Nerds? Terrible film. Don't blame any of you for not seeing it. It has a great montage scene. Um, can you think of something that has a montage in it? Virtually everything has a montage. Donnie Darko. Does Donnie Darko have a montage? Ah, there we go. Well, here's another example, which, who has seen the film um, Taxi Driver? All right. So here's an example of a montage. It's very much uh, a short ellipsis montage. It's taking an almost cu cubist view of um, this one little scene. But consider what's happening with the description of the taxi. We know what a taxi is, but the editor here isn't letting the camera, I haven't played it isn't letting the camera go all the way over the um, taxi to explain it. He's just touching on its taxiness. You'll see what I mean. So that not only describes New York, but the weather, the time of day, and perhaps his whole shift driving through. So we could have had a couple of minutes explained to ourselves, um, explained to us, the whole isness of what an American taxi looks like, or it also could have covered a whole eight-hour shift at night time where he just sees the same broken people parading street after street. You're going to say something? No. So all of these are reductive, the snipping time out, but they could also be expansive and we see this with any film that has um, explosions or horror films where the knife goes through the head several times from different angles at different speeds or an explosion where we see exploding from the left and the right and from underneath the car. It's only one explosion but it repeats itself again and again and again and again and we still accept it to be that whole thing. Now here is a very small snippet from, oh I didn't include it, oh because it didn't work, that's right I have to come back to here. Tell me to stop if this is too violent. So there's expansion. So here is expansion taking place. There. And there. Okay, it ends badly. I mean, it didn't start very well, but it ends a lot worse. 
Uh, watch the film. It's, um, it's good. So in summary, um, when joining two shots, and of course every shot thereafter, you have to consider these questions. Are they graphically continuous or discontinuous? Do they work together? Or are they a complete opposition? And it should be one or the other. You don't want things to be halfway wishy-washy. What rhythmic relationships are created? So rhythm is in pace of the cutting, movement of the camera, or the object. Are the shots spatially continuous? If not, what creates the discontinuity? discontinuity? If the shots are spatially continuous, how do the camera angles perceive this? So we saw that in Dead Men Don't Wear Plaid. It just cuts from one face to the other face, from one face to the other face. And that's still from Paris, Texas. It happened because of the background elements. Are the shots temporarily continuous? If so, what creates the continuity? So action matches. Um, another example of an action match is uh, Kurosawa. This is a very old film, but it has this great bit of action matching when you see the samurais running across the field. Samurai. So here we can see the differences in camera views being used as well. Far shot, close shot, far shot, close shot. There. We'll just play that again because the computer decided to pause when it didn't need to. So watch the men running. Seven different samurai, but all in the same location in the screen, all doing the same thing. All with the same objective, serving the same Lord. Um, so where were we? Um, are the shots temporarily conti um, continuous? If so, what c creates that continuity? So there was the action of running. They're all running. They're all in a different space, but we're all doing it at the same time. And if not, what creates discontinuity? Is there ellipsis? Is there expansion? Are we seeing something as a whole, or do we see glimpses of a bigger story? So again, the idea of the room versus the window. Generally, we look outside of a window when we're bored of the room. Windows often more interesting. Are there any questions? Just general exhaustion. Okay, so Sue's asking that I show this one again and see if you can now see new things happening within this title sequence. No, no, that's a really crappy version. Um, movies. Let's go for title sequences. Look at filing working for me. So back to Kyle Cooper and Imaginary Forces. Now look at that point of view of the fingers. We are those fingers. It's us doing that. The way that the shots are long and slow, but the text is quick and jittery. See there, that overlap. There's the idea of ellipsis happening. We see these glimpses of some kind of scrapbook happening. So we get the feeling that this is 
been happening for a long amount of time. The way that there's these jiggles, there's something unnerving going on. Now we have a quick ellipsis happening there. Mm. So we have we have a bit of a semantic match going on as well. So a match in meanings, just as the only bit of vocals of the music takes place, we have the graphic of God being removed from the um, idea of currency, which is a semiotic metaphor for value. And of course, one last thing that we see happening through this now is the idea of a motif which is the constant turning of the page we start with this image and it happens several times throughout the sequence which has this idea of cycle and continuity and the idea of um, this process happening day after day after day it's also the site well, yeah, the really book is a character. Yeah. The book is a character in this film. The book is almost the nar narrator in it. And the real actors are like the Greek chorus around the artifact. They're talking about it, but it's actually it that talks to the audience. Any questions now? Itchy neck. Bit of your hair in the eyes, yeah, another itchy neck. Yeah, the stretch, okay. Um, let's stop the screen recording. It's disappeared again. Who's got a question? Go on. What do you mean? I'm just With what? Okay, no, that's it. For, that's it for that's it for today. But but what we have been giving you is, and I hope we hope you realise is different ways, different models to see something, and it's applying that to your chosen film. So that's why the synopsis thing is really important now, and what everything is leading up to at this current moment of time is developing a storyboard. So it's distilling the film down to something that is between one and two and a half minutes long. And that's what you're producing this semester. Is that becoming more clear? Yeah? Is it becoming more confusing? Same time, yes, both. Okay. To me, all right. Okay, yeah. So, um, who has who has concerns about they don't know how to make it? That's all right. I mean, it, it's good to be honest. Um, what Sue's just been. Um, whispering in my ear is that there is this concern about the idea of medium. How do I make it? I know that I put it together or I do something in After Effects, that's a tool, but what's the content? 
The content, you can tell us. We're not saying it has to be character-based animation. We're not saying it has to be only typography. You can use your strengths here. If you would like to use photography, you can do that. If you would like to shoot video, then you're allowed to do that. If you want to make something that is a character-based animation, we would offer a little bit of warning about that because it does take a lot more time than you'd think, then that is fine as well. If you want to get one word and cast it out of ice and film it melting to have it play back backwards, God, that's complicated. You could do that. I don't know if you could make a puppet show. Yeah, you could do a shadow play. Um, there are no restrictions on what you want to do. If you want to develop your illustrator skills and put it together with After Effects, again, totally fine. Illustrator and After Effects. This is what you are telling us, yeah. starting this week. And then we will be negotiating it from this week onwards. So you will see on the brief, your homework is to make to create two artworks this week that tell us about the aesthetics and the ideas that you have that you wish to bring to the making of the type of sequence. And so all the analysis that you've been doing will come together this week when you make your first statement about how you see the type of sequence looking. And these works need to be finished before next week, on Monday of next week, because we have to start actually making the storyboard next week. So this week is an important week in terms of thinking about how you want to make this, what you want it to look like, what materials are you going to use, whether it's a stop motion or it's a video, or it's still photographs, or it's painting, or it's drawing, or it's cut out. You are telling us and then you are arguing for that. You have to have a rationale.